Hey church family, thank you for joining in today for worship. If you did not get my email yesterday, this may come as a surprise, but we have a change of plan. A lot has happened in the last few days, and our leaders felt that this is not a time for business as usual. Uh, we have another crisis that is unfolding. The protest that began in Minnesota has now spread over the whole nation. More than 30 cities have been ravaged by angry and violent protesters this weekend, including our own. Like many of you, I am angry with what happened in Minnesota. We cannot ignore these things. We shouldn't be silent about injustice around us. But it's also time for us, I believe, to turn to God and seek His face. That's exactly what we're going to do today. So I apologize for this last minute change, but if you are able, please join us via Zoom for a live service and worship this morning. You'll have to go to your computer or your phone and click the link below in the description section. Uh, if you're unable to join us, we will make the recording available shortly after our gathering. But if you can, uh, please make an effort to join us live so that we can pray together and hear what God has to say to us. See you soon. And uh, I've been really dealing with my own anger towards injustice that I've seen. And uh, yesterday, we've had some significant time to process uh, what is happening with our elders and pastors. And we really felt that there's no way that we can just go as business as usual and, and just pretend that nothing had happened. Uh, we had a wonderful sort of introductory message from our worship pastor, John Mann, who just joined us. Uh, we're going to hear from him in a little bit, but uh, uh, we decided to scratch that plan and we just felt like God is really calling us in this season uh, to really, yes, you know, some of us feel like we need to get on the street, but I think God is calling us to get on our knees first before we speak up, before we express our anger and frustration. So we really decided to make this a day of prayer and uh, we are going to process some of the things that we're feeling inside. And uh, so uh, that's the reason why we're kind of making this unusual change last minute and where we decided to go live. So uh, we're gonna start with the time of worship and then uh, after uh, we sing a couple of songs, uh, I've asked some of our leaders, our pastors, to just engage in a conversation with me. And uh, again, I'm sure you'll have a chance to also express and pour out your heart before one another, but I think this is really uh, what uh, God is asking us to do today. Uh, so why don't we center our hearts and, uh, on God and uh, just take a few moments to just still our spirit and then we'll enter into a time of worship. Jonathan, will you uh, lead us? Yep. Uh, as we enter a time of worship, um, if you have an instrument nearby and you want to play along, please feel free to do that. I'll have the words and the chords on uh, screen share. Does everyone see that? Just give a quick thumbs up if you do. Awesome. Um, so as, as I've been reflecting on uh, what has been happening in, uh, in our country in the last week, um, just I think like many of you have had this um, feeling of grief, of mourning, of frustration, um, and it reminds me of Nehemiah 1, where um, Nehemiah gets news that the walls of Jerusalem have been destroyed, or they have not been rebuilt, and it's terrible news that he was not expecting. <clears throat> and so he responds to that by, um, by mourning. Uh, it says that, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, uh, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Um, and then he prays after that, and he writes down his prayer in Nehemiah 1. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that, that Nehemiah's prayer, before he petitions the Lord, 
Um, he remembers God's character and who he is. Um, he says, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love uh, with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. Um, and then goes on with his prayer. And I thought it was really interesting because he, uh, before he tells God what he, what he wants and what he believes Israel needs, um, he holds on to God's character in that, in that moment of crisis. And so um, I wanted for us uh, this morning as we worship to, um, to sing songs that remind us of God's character uh, in the midst of what's happening right now. Uh, so if you'll sing this with me, uh, my hope is built on nothing less.
a time of prayer later. Um, I just wanted to sing this song uh, as a, a lead-in into that time um, to pray together. That God would give us a, a vision for his heart and how he sees our world. Um, that our prayer time would connect us to the heart of Jesus. Um, so let's sing this together. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. Where do I come from? Give you wisdom. You know just what to do. Let's do that again. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. God, we declare that you reign, Lord, that you are Lord of all. 
that Jesus, you are here in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our chaos, in the midst of whatever is happening on in this world. Father, we declare that Jesus, you are seated on your throne. Lord, we choose to worship you today. We choose to say that, God, you are good. We choose to say that, Lord, you are worthy of our honor, of our praise, of all glory. And God, as we gather here this afternoon, would you lead us, Lord, um, Lord, in this time? Would you lead us, Lord? Would you speak to us, Lord, even as we process the events that have happened um, in our country that are still happening um, right now? Lord, we bring to you our pain, our sadness, all of the injustices. Father, we know, God, that you, um, that you reign. And Lord, we say hallelujah to you. Father, we pray that even as we hear from you today, God, would you give us a soft heart? Would you give us open ears? Would you give us, Lord, your response, Lord, to what is going on? Father, we look to you. We don't look to ourselves. We don't look to the media. We don't look to even our feelings. But God, we look to you. And Lord, we submit this time into your hands. And we invite you here into our homes that, Holy Spirit, you would speak even as we reflect, even as we share, even as we pray. Would you guide us now? We love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, that we can be in community together right now. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for uh, making this last-minute uh, change and joining us today. And... Uh, I want to start with uh, a text message that I received from a good friend of mine. Actually, many of you know Kelvin Walker, who spoke at our Deeper Life conference. Uh, he sent me a little text message on the article that he's writing in response to what just happened this weekend. And again, you know, this is not uh, a random, uh, rare event. Just a few weeks before there was another incident and this is becoming almost like a, a normal routine of our American way of living. Uh, but I wanna read this uh, text message to you and I want us to really reflect on this. It occurs to me this morning that the white evangelical church in America spends millions upon millions of dollars annually in taking the gospel to the other nations, telling of the saving work of Jesus, how he died for all, the issue of sin in all humanity, and how salvation is found in Jesus and him alone. Quite often, the missionaries who go overseas to share the message of Jesus also come back and speak of the injustices that they see and grieve over in their work overseas. The racial, socioeconomic, and gender injustices. They speak of the ills of sex trafficking and the injustice of child slave labor. Further, the message they give is that the gospel demands that the church addresses those things and becomes the voice of the voiceless. Overseas, we do not see the gospel of salvation and the gospel that addresses the injustices of society as mutually exclusive. When the church ministered internationally, there is no such thing as a bifurcation of the true gospel and the social gospel. Why is it then when racism, socioeconomic injustice, and gender discrimination happen in America, the same church is woefully silent and or antagonistic to anyone who speaks out against these injustices? Why is it that this same church questions the legitimacy of claims of these injustices and rather than defending the poor, the disenfranchised, and the oppressed, we scrutinize the victims of such atrocities. Further, why is it that we, 
denounce believers who do speak out against such things and categorize them as people who preach a liberal or social gospel. To be clear, the same gospel that saves the soul of, for eternity also addresses the tra and transforms the lives of those who are suffering and oppressed in the here and now. To be clear, before the throne of God, there is no soul gospel and social gospel. It is the gospel, plain and simple. And the church that does not speak out against injustice is saying to those who are suffering from injustice, for your life with regard for eternity, I pray you accept Jesus and repent of your sin. But for your life here on earth, be warm and be fed the best way you can. You're on your own. That, my friends, is a half gospel. And that, my friends, does not please the heart of God. When I read this this morning, I really thought that it was a prophetic voice that the church needs to hear. Um, you know, we're all guilty uh, in some ways. Uh, even though we feel the pain of those people that are being oppressed at this moment, especially our black community, uh, we cannot fully experience uh, the pain, the sorrow, uh, even the extent of their suffering that has lasted for so many years. And, you know, as Asians, uh, we, we have our own wall in some ways. Uh, we, we have our own privilege behind which we can actually hide. And oftentimes we can be a little more distanced or even indifferent to what is happening in this country. But I feel that the Lord is really asking us to care for what is happening. And again, I think this is part of what the Lord has been doing in this COVID-19 crisis. He's exposing a lot of things uh, in our own personal heart and soul, as well as uh, the things that have been just plaguing the church and God's been exposing the things uh, of our society and our country. So uh, this is really a significant season where we need to really uh, seek God's face and pray. And I pray that we as a church will not be silent. I don't even know how to speak out and how to really speak up for the voiceless at this point. But it starts with us processing together and, and hearing God's voice together in this season. So uh, what I really want to share with you, I, I said earlier that the predominant uh, emotion that I've been feeling is this anger and frustration. But before we start pointing our fingers at other people, uh, those white police officers, or even our government officials for not really making any significant changes in our policies. Um, I just want to share, and this really comes from a very vulnerable and honest place, but you know, as I was fuming in anger of, over what happened, uh, I think it was the voice of the Spirit just whispering into my ear. I think it was yesterday. I heard this voice saying, what would you have done, Ted, if you were there? If you were in front of the scene where a black man was pinned down by a white police officer, what would you have done? Now, all of us want to say that I would have stepped in, I would have intervened, I would have told this cop to stop, or I would have done something. That's how we all feel, but we have to understand that if we had not known what was really going on, if we had not known that this man uh, was innocent, he did not commit a, a, a crime that deserves his own death, and we did not know all the background information that the media actually revealed to us, I have to be honest with you. I would have just sat there and I would have assumed that this police officer is stopping a crime. And maybe this guy did something terrible and he's just trying to stop a crime. You know, in that moment, uh, I think what the Lord really convicted me of is that, you know, this racism, this prejudice, this kind of bias is in all of us. 
I realized that even in my own heart, there's this virus of racism uh, that just plagues my own heart because we make all kinds of assumptions about people based on their color, the way they dress, or the way they talk. Even when people walk into our church, we make all kinds of assumptions about, you know, people that we meet. So I think today, I think the Lord is really wanting us to start this whole process of grieving and processing from uh, maybe a place of repentance, uh, just in our own hearts, for our own biases and prejudices and preferences and even putting ourselves in our own way of doing things at the center of our reality. So uh, this is really kind of uh, what I've been processing and what the Lord has been speaking to me in this last 24 hours, 48 hours. I've also invited uh, our pastoral team, uh, Pastor Douglas and Cheryl and Sandy and myself and John to join in in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, Leonora as well. Uh, we're not going to have a time as a whole group to talk about this. And we will have some time to break out and pray. And you will have an opportunity to process with one another. But I think it is important that we talk about how do we process what we're seeing, uh, what we're hearing, uh, what is actually happening in our society. And... Uh, uh, we want to maybe talk a little bit about what we should do as a Christians, because even in the morning, there are a lot of people, you know, when they were writing their emotions on the chat window, they said, I don't even know how to pray. I don't even know what to pray, uh, just in light of what, what is happening. And I think it's okay to feel that way. So I feel that this is really a significant moment for us to come together as a family. And I'm just really grateful that we can grieve together as a family. And we can process this together as a family, uh, communally. So I'm just really grateful. And um, I want to bring in some of these pastoral voices to really speak into this. And we'll process this together. So with that, um, Leonora, why don't I start with you? Uh, just unmute yourself. And... Leonora, you actually come from a very ethnically different background from many of us. And uh, especially as you witness uh, some of these things, just share with us what's been going through your mind, your heart, and how you're processing uh, this event. Uh, the rest of you, if you just put your, there's a speaker view on top, uh, then you'll get to hear directly from one of our speakers. So Leonora, go ahead and share what God's been uh, speaking to you in this uh, last couple of days? Yeah. Well, when um, I first got the news, um, waking up and seeing everything on social media, um, on every platform, somebody was posting something about what was going on. And my first initial thought was, why now is everybody saying something? Why now? This has been going on for centuries you know but why now is everybody saying something so i kind of just ignored it and went about my day um, i didn't really look further on the news to see what was going on um, and the next day um, i saw the video and when i saw the video of what happened to george floyd um, i was deeply grieved and this grief carried on overnight for about the next uh, 24 hours i actually woke up in the middle of the night a few times um, uh, and just would start crying thinking about the video that i saw um, and this man but i wondered you know i think the grief was so um deep I didn't know why I was grieving so hard for this man. In fact, I grieved more for him than just the passing of my godfather a couple months ago. So I knew that there was something wrong, that there was something other than just me grieving for him. Um, but as I watched the video, um, I, I, it really hit me that, you know, the black community is really hated. And I think for me, you know, most of you may know I am, you know, I'm Salvadorian and I am black. And growing up, um, I have uh, been told that, you know, at least I wasn't, you know, black 
like other people were black. At least I'm mixed. At least I'm light skinned, you know, and hearing all of these things actually um, made me feel disconnected to the black community. And so going through, you know, all these emotions that, that were coming up, um, I didn't really know where they were all coming from. But when I was just praying and asking the Lord, like, Lord, you know, I have all these different emotions and the predominant one was anger. Um, why am I angry? What am I even angry at, you know? And I think what I was feeling was I was angry because the rea the, all of a sudden the reality of the black community being hated was real to me. Um, that wasn't really re real to me before. I grew up here in the Bay Area, literally one of the most diverse places in the world. And um, that it really wasn't my experience. And so um, I felt that, that uh, just that seeing the hatred for the black community, but then I also realized that I had internally, I had a hatred for the black community as well, which was extremely surprising, not only for the black community, but for part of myself and a part of who I was. And so the Lord brought me back to some childhood memories. Um, uh, the first one that I remember was just my my mom's father, who's Salvadorian, um, him not wanting to have anything to do with me and my siblings because we were Black. And so all these different things that were spoken to me or spoken over me, um, I actually partnered with them. And it was like, yeah, at least I'm, you know, not that Black, you know, so at least I'm not like them. And realize that all that carried into um, having a hatred towards um, part of who I was. And I think the last couple of years I've been asking the Lord, you know, Lord, why is it that I don't care to take care of myself? You know, what is about me that I don't care to take care of like my body? And he showed me this week that it's because there was actually a part of me I hated um, and I didn't care about. So that was actually a big shocking, you know, um, revelation for me um, through all of this. But I think the, the, the Lord's actually been really healing me and I'm, I'm grateful that he showed me this. But the, um, over this past week, I've been getting text messages asking like, well, what are we supposed to, you know, what do we do for people who are not black? You know, what do we do? How should we pray? And I truly sense that like, you know, in this season, God is revealing so much of our heart um, and what is within us that when we love God with all of who we are, when we love him with all of our mind, all of our heart, even the ugly part of it, and give and submit all of it to him, I, um, we are able to love ourselves and we are able to love others. And so there is no like strategy on how to you know, change, um, change our, our ways except submitting our heart to him. And so that's what he showed me this week um, in all of this was that, how, you know, I had no idea that was in my heart. Like, you don't know how surprising that is to know there is a part of me I hated um, because of some things that were spoken over me. So I uh, thank God for this, um, for, for him, you know, speaking this into me and, um, and healing me um, through this process. But it, it is a reality that uh, the black community is, is hated. Thank you for being so real. You know, what I'm really hearing from your sharing, and I think I can totally identify with it. Oftentimes our prejudice or our even racism is, is a reaction to our own deep wounds that we have received. So on the flip side of that is if we're not really healed uh, from our own past wounds and whatever we experience in life, I don't think we'll ever be able to love those people that God brings into our lives. So exactly. thank you for really affirming that. Uh, I'm going to bring John, John in. And by the way, this is John's first time actually meeting all the New Vine family. Uh, I think he came to visit uh, back in February. And, uh, and then finally, he just started two weeks ago. So everything is so new. And John, you also made this most unusual move in the midst of the most unusual and chaotic season. I don't really know of many people who would uh, uh, replant 
uh, across the country in the middle of a lockdown. And then uh, obviously, you know, with what happened in the last uh, 48 hours, so much must have been going through your mind. Uh, just share with us what you're really processing in this season and how you're actually even navigating through this change uh, that you're experiencing. Yeah, you know, um, when when I first uh, heard about what had happened and saw the video earlier in the week, um, my I think my er, er, initial response was one of frustration and anger. Um, I was upset about uh, the that this is our reality and that it keeps happening. Like like I kept asking myself, why why does this keep happening to to the African American community, um, and uh, I think I had some frustration because I I, was, I felt like I'm new to San Jose. I don't know where anything is. Um, even if I want to go join protests, like I don't really know how to get there. I don't know people um, that are connected to um, you know different justice movements, um, and so there was a lot of frustration uh, for that, and um, and then I think that frustration kind of shifted a little bit and turned into shame um, where I, I realized like how quickly, um, how easy it was for me to disconnect myself from what was happening. And even that feeling of like, oh, why does this keep happening? I really think that because I'm hearing more about it more recently. Like it's just in recent history that it's been filmed or it's been put on social media. And so we see it much more frequently but the reality is that this has been happening for hundreds of years. And I have the privilege of, of not having that history hanging over my head. Um, and then on top of that, like even as, an, as, a, as a minority, knowing that um, you know, I have benefited from the civil rights movement, from African-American community in ways that I don't acknowledge or don't uh, show gratitude for. And instead, very easy for me to just turn a blind eye to it and ignore what's happening. Um, so I think in the midst of those two first, those two feelings of frustration and shame, um, again, I was reminded of that passage in Nehemiah that I read earlier um, and how Nehemiah really holds on to the character of God. And so um, I spent part of this week just really thinking about like what parts of God's heart and his character um, do we see most in in situations like this right or, or do we need to see most in situations like this and absolutely uh, we see we need to see god's heart of compassion in the church and in, in his people and in myself i need to see that do i have compassion for the oppressed and for the hurting um do i uh and and also um you know our god is a god of truth and am i seeking out what is true uh and navigating all the different um false realities or lies that that we might be presented um and um but i think probably uh, above both of those even um you know i was reminded that our god is a god of grace and forgiveness and there is a call to um to forgive the uh the oppressor to forgive um maybe those who have lost who are protesting and have lost control um and to extend grace towards them um, I think probably personally it was easier to extend grace towards a protester than it was to like one of those four police officers, but we're still called to do that. Uh, but then equally as important is, is my belief that the gospel never separates grace and justice and the grace that we um, receive at the cross is purchased by the justice that Jesus experiences and so if we're to reflect him, then we really need to um, reflect both the grace and the justice that he demonstrated for us at the cross in, in our world. Um, and so I think that was the hard, that's the hard part for me is what does that actually look like in my life? Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think that when I forget God's character, that's when I fall into the trap of just responding. Maybe the world want the way the world wants to respond. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, we don't like the word shame, uh, but there is a healthy kind of shame. And just even from your sharing, I felt the same thing, even as a church. Uh, I have to say I was a little ashamed because I didn't know how to respond, how to react, and how to even engage, and how to speak up for these people who have no voice. Uh, so I think this is something that we're going to have to really wrestle with. And um, uh, I just going back, you talked about God's grace as well as his justice. You know, sometimes we have a tendency to just emphasize on one over the other. Uh, Calvin earlier in the text that, you know, I read uh, to all of you, he talked about why is it that, you know, we put so much focus on going overseas and taking the gospel to bring salvation. And yet, uh, overseas, there's no distinction between social justice issue versus our soul justice or soul salvation. Whereas when things like this happen in America, there's such a dichotomy. And sometimes those people speak up are oftentimes labeled as liberals or uh, socialists. So I think there's a lot for us to really wrestle with in this season. And especially as an Asian American church, I think uh, this is really a season where we have to take what God is really laying before us seriously. And we cannot just brush this aside as a cultural or ethnic issue. Um, with that, Cheryl, can I invite you to come on up? And uh, I remember, Cheryl, you also shared your own experience. You had some pain in your own life uh, as uh, uh, Asian American growing up as an immigrant child. And I remember you sharing this story, but how has this season and what you saw uh, is really shaping your heart in this season? What is God really speaking to you about the whole issue of racism and um, this ethnic or racial tension that we're experiencing right now. Thanks, Pastor Ted. Um, so for me, you know, when I watched that video, uh, obviously I could only, it was so horrific. I wasn't able to even watch it more than once. But for me, where the Holy Spirit was really convicting me was um, in that police officer that was Asian, that was standing on the side. Um, and as some of you may have seen or noticed, you know, he uh, was part of that team of four and he was an onlooker uh, in the same team as the one that was perpetrating the murder. Um, and, you know, he pushed people away and, and he was there. And, I, you know, I, I have been reflecting about, well, gosh, what, what might have been going through his mind? You know, maybe he was thinking, oh, you know, that's just my partner. He just gets angry or... You know, maybe he was thinking in his mind, well, you know, my role is to keep the peace. And, you know, the Holy Spirit convicted me um, that I am that police officer. Um, I, you know, as a person of Asian descent, I um, have been someone who, you know, has been part of a culture and myself included, where kind of keeping the peace or keeping the status quo uh, so that, you know, that you have, you know, conflict avoidance, uh, that that is often seen as the higher ground uh, than the call for justice. And it sort of just, it hit me that, you know, this, that, that I am guilty in my passive state, uh, not only personally, but culturally, um, as, a, as a member of, of one who is Asian American. I think uh, as Pastor John spoke, you know, we have reaped the benefits, um, you know, that the African American community has fought so hard and yet we stay silent at times of this. We, we, we tend to think, you know, gosh, this is an issue of black and white and we think that this does not relate to us. Uh, but I, I really saw that in his passive state, um, that this is exactly what I do. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it was clear to me that I think that as people that are of Asian American descent, we need to come together um, as, as those that, are, that identify as Christ followers to come and repent 
together uh, just as a, as a culture for our tendency to really just underplay things like this and to, to do nothing, uh, to stand by passively. I personally was convicted of times where when I've seen injustice that I kind of just stand by because I didn't want to rock the boat or times where I've been in a position of power but have not used that power to right the wrong. Um, and so I, I just sense that this is really a time as a church that we come together, um, you know, whether it be as New Vine, as the Church of Jesus Christ, uh, just in a spirit of repentance, uh, repentance for our being passive. Um, but also, you know, personally, I also know, I, I'm just going to call it out that, you know, Asians, you know, maybe we second generation folks may hide that a little bit more, but I know that there are many of our forefathers uh, that are just outright, uh, you know, very uh, explicit, uh, you know, in their racism, uh, their fear of the African American community or their opinions about that. Uh, and so just really calling out uh, just a time of repentance for the church. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for calling it out. Uh, because uh, many of us, we come from a culture that values uh, harmony, peace, which is really not a peace, it's more of a fake peace that we try to preserve. And fake harmony uh, is more of a, a fear of conflict because we don't want things to be disrupted. And I think oftentimes uh, churches are guilty of that. We just want to maintain the form of harmony and peace at the expense of true peace that Jesus really wants to bring. So I think we have a, a lot of work ahead of us, even as a church uh, that does not know how to face conflict and how to confront injustice. Uh, I think we'll have to really learn to do this well uh, with the grace and love uh, that Jesus shows. But you know, if I think about it, Jesus was never afraid of confronting injustice. I can think of him literally just throwing all the tables upside down and taking out a whip and driving people out of the temple. Uh, because for him, it was not about the business or making money. It was about the injustice, inequality that was actually taking place. So uh, we have a lot to learn in this season. Um, since... Douglas, you're on the screen. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, uh, share what's on your heart as a pastor of this congregation? What is God really putting on your heart? Yeah, you know, um, earlier in the week when when the, the, the tragic event happened on Monday, you know, I was like, you know, obviously feeling upset, feeling angry, feeling sad. Um, but I think over the, the period of a few days over this week, um, it didn't really... I guess maybe hit home until Friday uh, when I heard that the 101 was shut down. Um, for some of you that may know, the 101 where it was shut down um, by downtown San Jose was very close to our San Jose church, just a few exits away. And, you know, and then there was like, you know, the protests um, in City Hall and, and around downtown and stuff. And, and I, I felt like, you know, something changed within me from Monday to Friday and then I felt like God asking me the question, well, why did it take you a few days to really feel like you had to, I don't know, stand up or, or, or feel like there really is an issue? Like, you know, something that happened in Minneapolis, shouldn't that have affected me? And I, I feel like the Lord was just revealing in my own heart, you know, maybe there is some, I don't know, like bias or racism or or just I, I guess I felt like it shouldn't have to take something that's hitting our own unique community you know that close to home before I should see the injustices um, that God was already showing me or at least to, to feel like wow this is you know, this is something that we really cannot ignore. And I, I think as, as some of us have shared, you know, this isn't an isolated incident. You know, this has happened time and time again. Um, and, and so I, I felt like, you know, over the last few days, I've really been asking God, yeah, what is it that you want us to do? What is it that you want us to, to be praying for as, as a church, as believers, you know, as people who, who, who um, want to love others 
Um, and it, it's, it's been a process, but, you know, just, I guess, processing it with all of you verbal, uh, you know, um, is, is helping. But I, I do feel that God was really surfacing some things in my heart um, over the last few days. Oftentimes I feel like, you know, as we look at, you know, these kind of events and uh, crises, our hearts get so numb. Uh, and, you know, we react and we get angry, we get upset. And then uh, a few days later, we just move on with life and until something more tragic or terrible happens. And then we react again. So... I think one of the things that I really want to challenge all of us today is really to think about what is, as a church and as God's people, what is the best way for us to really bring about any kind of meaningful transformation, changes to our society? And more so, I want us to really think about what is my part? Uh, again, you know, that's a really difficult question to answer. I mean, how do we even change a system? Maybe it's not about changing a system. Maybe it's about how I live out that gospel, not just our soul gospel, but also the social as well. How do we really do this uh, in a way that will really bring about some form of real transformation in my relationship with others, in my community, in your workplace? So I think these are some of the things that I really want you to wrestle with, even as you pray with one another. Uh, I'm going to ask my wife, Sandy, to uh, just share her thoughts because, you know, ever since this happened, you know, it brought back a lot of memory. Uh, Sandy was a little girl at the time uh, when L.A. riot broke. Uh, it was uh, 1992. I want to make sure that I give the right year. 1992. I was a little older, uh, but I vividly remember all of the atrocities, the riot, the anger that lasted for days and killing, you know, we even know some people who lost their lives in this whole thing. So, uh, you know, it's been really painful. And I think she's been kind of reliving that whole experience as an adult. So I'm going to have her share uh, just her experience in this whole uh, crisis. And, and uh, maybe she can share some ways that we can really uh, navigate through you know, our, our hurt and our emotion in the season. So here's my wife, Sandy. Ted's definition of little girl is a junior in high school. Um, so this whole week brought, definitely brought back a lot of memories. I had to actually read through some of the historical facts because um, it's almost 30 years ago. Um, 1991, there was a similar incident which did not lead to death, but uh, Rodney King was pretty uh, brutally beat up by four white LAPD uh, officers. And then a week after that incident, um, a young 15 year old black girl was um, shot, fatally shot at a convenience store owned by Koreans who happened to be our family friend. Um, and then on April 29th, 1992, the four police officers were acquitted of all their charges. And that day um, was a huge defining moment in LA history where the LA riots uh, began. And I lived in the heart of that. Um, my high school was actually shut down for many days because they were telling us to stay shelter in place. Um, I remember during that time, uh, there was no church gatherings like this to help us navigate through violence and racial tension. Um, as an immigrant uh, Korean family, we were taught to stay quiet. We were taught to keep within our own ethnic safe boundaries. There were clear ethnic boundaries all over Los Angeles County. If you're a Latino, you stay in your community. If you're a Korean, you stay in your community. If you're Black, there was no crossing over. And as uh, Asians, I was, I was taught to stay quiet, to mind my own business and turn the other way. And so um, this week, uh, I actually went back and looked at some of the TV footage 
And I was reminded also my aunt was a Target. She was a convenience store owner. Um, my own high school friend's brother decided to go and speak some sense into these Korean business store owners who were on top of their business buildings with guns, ready to shoot down anybody who would come into their store to loot. And my friend's brother was the first um, uh, Korean who was slain by our own people. It was a very tragic, tragic day for all of us. Um, growing up, I was taught just to turn a blind eye. And if you engage, you're risking your own life. And some of my friends who did want to engage um, have lost their own lives as well. And so as I was looking at the video footage of George Floyd's death, um, it was heart wrenching for me. But the more painful part was to see that Asian man, uh, the cop, just standing very passively. And as Cheryl mentioned, it was that was more heart wrenching for me as an Asian American. And I, in front of my kids, I called him a coward. I called him all sorts of names, like how dare he can just stand there allowing such a, a murder and violence to happen to an innocent man. And God really pointed out, this is the same passivity you've lived with all your life. Um, you've always turned a blind eye to injustice. You get angry and grieve and complain, but it just stays within my own heart. And I have not engaged in prayer and repentance and not engaged with really bringing this gospel um, into these kind of situations. And so what is our response? My daughter said, let's go and do that silent protest. Um, do we get more active on social media? And God just really challenged me, would you really pray for healing and pray for peace and reconciliation? It's not just about racial reconciliation, but it's about restless, broken hearts that really need the gospel to transform them. I think when we, our hearts are truly transformed by the gospel and we are reconciled to Christ, that reconciliation bears fruit in all of our relationships, even across our racial tensions. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 5.19. It says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. This pandemic has exposed the restless hearts that all of us have been dealing with. And now this murder of George Floyd is exposing the restless condition of our society. And today, I really want to give a charge to all of us. And this is the message that God has given to me, is will I cry out for the reconciliation of people's hearts ultimately to the Lord? Do I truly believe that the gospel can transform hearts and transform society? When our hearts have been gripped and transformed by the good news, reconciliation and peace will be the direct fruit of that. We cannot miss that important truth. As we pray for the victims and also the offender, they all need the gospel right now. I think God's going to show us how we need to engage and respond as a church. But that response must come from a place of really crying out to the Lord and lament and grieve and really receiving his heart. His heart is grieving as well. His heart is in pain but he is also a God of justice and compassion. And I think as we wrestle with God in prayer, he's gonna give us a clear assignment. This is how you are to go. I give you courage and wisdom to know how to engage with the world during this crisis and how to really be a light of Christ uh, to carry that message of reconciliation to the world. Uh, just a very practical thing I think any of us can do is obviously the police department is a big, target of judgment and criticism right now. And um, Eddie Garcia, the chief of police of San Jose, had an amazing kind of pep talk with his crew. Um, and if you find it somewhere, it's, it was so encouraging for me to hear. And I realized that we have uh, the gift of blessing. We have the gift of words. We have the gift of encouragement as a church. And I think what we can do, whatever age our kids are, we can write a letter of blessing um, saying that we're covering you, police department, in prayer, and just really give words of life to them at this time. Um, that's just one practical tip. 
my family and I are planning to do this week. Okay. So uh, we're going to wrap up our time together as a whole group and uh, I'll send you into smaller groups to process and pour out your heart before one another and ultimately before God. Uh, but just to really summarize what we're hearing from the Lord today, uh, he's really giving us permission to grieve. Uh, I think, again, you know, there are two ways to grieve. One is to really just grieve from our own human heart. Uh, but I think we need to really get a hold of God's grief over our city, our society, what we're going through. Uh, so I want to really ask you to enter into that grief that God has for us. Um, he's also giving us permission to be angry. And again, uh, you know, God's anger is very, very different from how we feel. A lot of our anger comes from a place of self-righteousness, uh, even hypocrisy. Uh, but God's anger is perfect. Uh, divine wrath is, is based on his perfect justice. So uh, I think this is where we can really ask, even as our hearts feel that anger, pray that our anger will line up with, with you know, how God feels about uh, our humanity and, and this place. So uh, pray for that as well. Uh, but ultimately, what God is really speaking to us today is that our protest has to be more than just the grief and anger. Oftentimes, that's where things just stop, and that's not going to change anything. That is not going to produce any fruit. But God is really calling us out of our passivity. Uh, I don't know how. Uh, maybe it'll start with just something as simple as writing a blessing card. Uh, for some of you, maybe it's making a, a friend who's of different background, different color, different socioeconomic situation, uh, different ethnic background. So, or even inviting that person into your home for a meal. Uh, we have to engage. If we don't, again, it's just going to be a reaction uh, that's just going to stay as a reaction and nothing changes. So uh, I want to really bless you to wrestle with these things. And, you know, as we go into smaller groups today, uh, I want to make sure that you have a space and time to just really process and talk about uh, what you're feeling. At the same time, I hope you'll have the courage to really call out, you know, what we really need to confront, uh, even in our own heart even in our own church and our community. One thing that is beautiful about New Vine is that even though we have a lot of Asians, we're not just an Asian church. We're not just a community made up of one type of people. And that is really what the kingdom of God is going to look like uh, in the future. Uh, that reflects the real kingdom. And so we have to fight until we reach that reality, even, even as a church. So pray that over new vine community over our fellowship and uh, uh spend some time really blessing our city as well as uh, our communities uh, in the next 30 minutes or so uh we're gonna have one more song john are you ready to lead us in one more song the blessing are we going to yeah can you lead us in the song Yeah, we actually wanted to sing this song over our city. Uh, we did that in the morning. Uh, uh, we just had to play a clip. But, you know, as we sing this last song, uh, Sandy mentioned, God has given us authority, power to bless. And it's not just a wish. I think as we speak these words out and as we sing it over, you know, the people of our city, uh, people of this country, let's believe together that God's actually going to release the gift of his blessing and favor. So, John, when you're ready, go ahead and lead us. Lord, 
Time the Lord bless you. Lord, we thank you for this gift of peace and the promise of your favor and your presence. 
Uh, we pray that this gift will not just be for your church, but we will be the carriers of such gift to those around us, Lord. Uh, teach us how to be your church. Teach us how to shine in this moment of crisis. And teach us how to be the vessel of your glory. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to break up into smaller groups. And I'm going to give uh, some time for our supernova young adults. Uh, if you, you have your own uh, gathering, Zoom link. Uh, so I'll just give you a few seconds to disconnect. And then uh, I'll put the rest in smaller groups. <laughs> 